My name is Tony Parasram. I'm the founder and director of Freeform uh, Consulting, as Simon said, in 2009. And it's an e-practice. How many of you... This is going to be a little bit more like a TED Talk, to be perfectly honest. I'm not going to be standing behind this. I'm going to be walking up and down. Uh, and I'm going to ask for uh, your input. Uh, who, who's heard of an, a, a consulting e-practice? Has anybody in the architecture, engineering, anything like that? Yeah? Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. He's going to say me. Um, I think I was interested in the answer to that uh, because... ICE and iStructi haven't heard of an e-practice uh, within the, the, under the umbrella of ICE and iStructi. So we think, it's a boastful thing, but we think we're the first. Um, I believe we're the first, and the model uh, that we can, uh, others can, can, can use. And what this evening's about is it's not a um, technical talk. Often these talks are about a bridge or a building or something like that, you know, it's usually omega all squared over 8. I said that once, and somebody said QL squared over 8. I said, what's Q? And I was, I was showing my age there, because in my day it was omega. Um, so this is more about psychology. This is about the psychology of how an e-practice works, uh, which I thought might be more interesting or, or just different to uh, a normal technical talk. Uh, so hopefully you'll find it stimulating, uh, some ideas. Uh, I'm looking at the age group in the room, and I'm going to be using some terms which might resonate with some of you because uh, on, on the older ones it, it's a little bit, a little bit more difficult. Um, so let's get started with what Freeform do. I'm going to break this down into, um, into the who and, wh and where and then we'll look at the how and the why. No, it's the other way around. Who and the where and then we'll look at the why and the how. So who are we and where are we? So I'm just going to play this little video here. Okay, that's a little flavor of, uh, of what we do and where we do it. Just want to go into another little video there, but before I play that. So that's, that's kind of what we do and where we are. We uh, are a multidiscipline practice uh, that do, uh, as Simon said, with civil engineering, structural engineering. Um, we've done work for Port of Dover, Eurotunnel, um, local, local authorities, private developers, architects. We're doing some stuff with BDP right now. Uh, so quite a range, quite a range, even down to small, I say small, sort of larger uh, residential properties, uh, that kind of thing. I wanted to show this, this animation here uh, for a reason, and that is, which is a very cool car anyway, as, as all the components come together, they're all individual, but it's only when the skin comes on that we see the final picture, and that's the thing. I've noticed that when I, when I share about uh, the e-practice or how it works and why it's, why it's worked over these years, uh, we've been going something like nine years now. Next year's our big 10. We've got a big bash coming up that we're going to organize uh, and arrange. And that quite often, uh, individuals would break it down into what we think we understand, which is natural. It's a human thing to do. Um, and in so doing, we can miss the bigger picture. And that's what that animation really was about. Let me go to the beginning of this. And we can get into this properly. There we go. So, um, I'm going to invite you to uh, hold back on determining what you think or how you think this works. Or it's just like it works like this or it works like that. It's a bit of everything. It's a, quite a, it's a hybrid. I, uh, that's me, uh, FIC, FI Structi, Freeform Consulting, blah, 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 director. The Undoing the Revolution was a title I chose because um, I heard it from a friend of mine. And he said, well, you're kind of undoing the revolution a little bit. Thought, what, are you, what are you on about? I said, what revolution? And what he meant was the Industrial Revolution. The 
Around the uh, uh, mid to late 18th century and into the mid 19th century was the Industrial Revolution. And the, it started all with the first, with the first uh, factory, really, after a mill had been created, a spinning frame. And this chap, Richard Arkwright, kicked the whole thing off. But what happened was, when, with, with the advent of, of the Industrial Revolution and mechanization and factories, came migration. So all of these people, <coughs> excuse me, went from rural areas, mass migration into factories, into, and towns became cities, and cities became, I don't know, super cities or, or large urban environments that we know today. And we've inherited that. <coughs> I've got hay fever, you've got to forgive me. Um, we've inherited that. We invariably, in this room, I won't, I won't ask for a show of hands, but invariably in this room, we get up, we commute, we go to a job, we go to a building, we go to a site, we, we go somewhere. And invariably, we spend nine to five in that place, and then go home again. And that's what this kicked off, the Industrial Revolution. Um, so the internet comes along, and it brought a revolution. It, we see we can shop for cars, houses, clothes, we can shop for anything online. And I'm sure a, a goodly percentage of the folk in this room not only have experience of shopping online, but you do an, a, a decent amount of it if you're really totted it up. The rise of social media, and uh, in the very early days with Friends Reunited, then it became, I don't know, then we had Facebook, Twitter, and all, all the others, Instagram, and all the rest of it. Really given, uh, given platform by servers and the internet. Research. How much of your research is done on Bob? Who uses Barber Index? Anybody uses Barber Index? Oh, one. Okay, great. Who uses just Google? Thank you. All right. Case in point. That's it. You know, it's now become a verb. A noun has become a verb. Google has become something. Like, Did you Google that? Well, that was a noun. We were using it as a verb. So research increasingly. Please tell me we don't design stuff from Wikipedia. Um, working practices. Our working practices have changed in that we, uh, even when I was a, a local authority, I, I was seconded to run a, a structures department at, at um, a local authority. And even back then, we're talking about, I don't know, what was that, 2006, 2005, there was talk of uh, working from home and hot desking. Anybody hear hot desks? Your, your office has been turned into a call center with lines of hot desks and you're not allowed to own a mug. You barely get a pedestal. And uh, it's anonymous. Working practices have changed. It's even affecting the look of our high street. It's in the uh, newspapers. It's, in the, it's in the, uh, uh, on, on, on the main news on TV that such and such has gone bust. Or they're closing. They're no longer there. Some of the big names have gone because of online retailing. So, ultimately, it's about communication. Which, uh, because this is about e-practice... And we, <coughs> excuse me, the, if, if you're in the unfortunate position that you're involved in any kind of litigation or a court case to do with a project, it's 99% of the time because of a failure in communication, not because of failure technically. It's very rare that we get catastrophic collapses uh, that leads to litigation. Normally, it's because the contract has not been paid or that somebody's edging for a, des for a design change and the client says no or something like that. Communication is invariably broken down. The thing is still standing. Uh, the project might go on ice, but invariably it's about communication. And communication is at the heart of what we do. It's how we, unless we are a, a specialist one-man band at home with a dog and a drawing board and do what we do, 99% of the time, again, we are collaborating with others, communicating with others, and um, producing something with others. And there are three things about um, communication. How many of you have heard things like verbal and nonverbal? And, and there's a belief that most of it is nonverbal, and only a percentage of it is verbal, and we retain something like 3% of what we hear, something like that. I mean, that's all anecdotal, and it's some, somebody's done some research on it, and there's, there's been publications. But it's within a fixed context, which is why I don't like using those stats. Because the authors of those uh, publications have, have said, look, I did that piece of research within a context, within, a, within a, a, a set parameter. So you can't just go banding around those numbers. However, what we do know 
is that there are three C's to communication, which is context, the environment you're in, the person's role. So in other words, if you're a, you might be a, a, a director speaking to a senior engineer, or a senior engineer speaking to a graduate engineer or an architect, and, and so forth. That hierarchy of role can dictate the context. Uh, cluster, body language. In other words, if you are sitting opposite somebody in a, in a meeting and you see them sort of just do that, and they just fold their arms and they sit back and they, they, they just lean back. You, you can read something into that, can't you? They haven't said anything, but their body language has told you an awful lot about whether they're engaging or disengaging in the conversation. So gestures and the sequence of clustering gestures, which means that if there's a repeated gesture, uh, you know, shaking of the fist, it's a repeated uh, gesture, or if there is a, a, a consistent gesture that's coming back again and again to, to a, a constant nod, it may be an individual nod, but if there's a constant nod, you know that you've got their approval in that meeting. So cluster and congruence. In other words, where the three things come together, the body language, the tone, and what's being said. All of these things are communication. I'm standing here communicating to you now, and it's intentional that I'm in this position and not behind there. This says I want to hide from people. I just, I'd rather that there was a barrier between us. So there's, there's got to be a consistency with what's being said, the tone of voice, and we take it for granted. We're trained in this from very young, communicating at home for our parents. Freeform is, as I say, I believe the first e-consultancy, certainly that IC and iStructy have heard of. And we are, that's not the whole team, and I'll explain why it's not the whole team. The whole team, including all the support, is about, numbers about 20. And if the, were they all to be on there, they roughly patch about six countries at present. So we don't have offices. We started in 2009 in January and uh, we've been going ever since, growing and growing steadily, starting off as a, uh, an engineering design practice and then branching out into well, civil design, structural design, uh, ports and harbours, architecture, asset management, project management, interior design. It's quite a range. And uh, with, we're paperless, uh, there's no commute, uh, anecdotally and often say, my team designed in their pyjamas. Who doesn't want to design in their pyjamas? Wouldn't it be great if you could design in your pyjamas? My, my commute personally is I walk out of my bedroom and just into my office, and that's it. And it's the best commute I've ever had in life. I've never worked, worked hard in my life. If you want to work less hours, stay PAYE if you're PAYE. If you want to work more hours, do your own thing because you work like an absolute donkey. But it's enormous fun. It's huge fun. So we are, uh, we've got, most of the team are in the UK dotted all over the place. Um, and then we've got uh, down here, we've got Luis over in Bogota. Luis is actually on mute on the call, so he's gonna come in later on. And then we've got the team in Spain down here and uh, uh, Paris. That sounds like his unmuting. Um, it's all about communication, as I said before. So. The challenge is, how do we, how many of you work in practices with satellite offices? You've got satellite offices, okay. How many of you work in practices with satellite offices abroad? They're abroad, okay. How many of you have personal experience working with that team abroad? Okay. Has that ever given you translation or cultural differences in dealing with the teams abroad? Have you ever had that issue? Yeah, I've got some nod, sort of. Um, in the very early days of, of um, when, with my two firms back, uh, they started off a, uh, a satellite office in, I think it was the Philippines, then it went to India or something. Like the usual story, it was a, there was a big drive to put CAD out there because everybody thought they could do CAD cheaply out there. And then eventually that wasn't working because the local teams couldn't, couldn't understand how to sync with the London teams, so we sent out a UK chap to run the local teams. He rubbed everybody up the wrong way, he ended up coming back, and all sorts of things. I was working in a project in Singapore for a year. In fact, the, uh, uh, Luis, who's on the call, worked uh, with myself and the chap in, in Paris. Um, 
uh, Oliver, he was with us on that. There's some images. How many of you have heard of Gardens by the Bay? It's uh, in Marina Bay. There's uh, the, the, the image out and the entrance there of the super trees. That's Gardens by the Bay. Well, Luis designed that. He's on the call. And so these guys work with me in free form. And one of the things about that was understanding how the, it works in the Far East. So we're going in there with this, with this Western mindset or whatever and not understanding that, well, you know, some within the team didn't understand about the whole saving face and the whole appreciating the culture and all that kind of stuff that goes with it. And that created a, a few problems. So it is all about communication. So how good are we at communication? What makes an effective team? I'm sure, without a show of hands, that we invariably in this room work in teams. You work in a design team. You work as, uh, you, you may be uh, overseeing uh, younger, uh, junior staff. You may be the junior staff starting out. But you work in a team of some sort. Who recognises that photograph there? Does anybody recognise that one? Yeah, you recognise that one. That's uh, Oblivion. Yeah. And she's constantly saying, she's a, a computer-generated image. We find out in the end. I'm not going to spoil the film for you, but she's not real. Um, and her main thing is, are you an effective team? Are you an effective team? That's a big thing for them. Are you an effective team? So what makes an effective team? Well, that's us. That's freeform. I couldn't help put that one in. That, you know, it's fun. All of this stuff is fun. I don't have any photographs of Freeform doing a design or doing a drawing because we're remote. We're, we don't work like that. We have senior engineers. We have junior engineers. We have design team meetings. We have design reviews. We manage risk like any other office. We have weekly team meetings. We go through minutes. We uh, review uh, uh, concepts together. We test them. Everything that you would do. We do it virtually. And so the only images I do have is us having fun. And that looks like pretty good fun to me. So the key one about this is, is it just social events? What makes an effective team? There's a, is that a, a was that, a, investors in people. Companies invariably went for investors in people. It, it was a big fad. You know, I've got to get investors in people because then I'm a better employer and graduates are going to come to me and it's going to be wonderful because they see I'm an investors in people which is really just a tick box exercise. Because when you get in there, it's, it's quite often like any other firm. And then we try and do social events. We go out for the beer night or the beer Friday or the pizza Friday or whatever. We try and copy whatever's Google doing. We put its pool table in there. Everybody's on roller skates or Heelys. But e-practices don't have any of this. We don't have a coffee machine. We don't have a water cooler, which is the anecdotal when people gather in the kitchen. You ever see that? In, in, if your company has a little cafe or a little tea station or something, people gather there. They have a quick chat. We don't have breakout spaces. We don't have a cafe. So we don't have the infrastructure that a lot of the conversations take place. And those conversations may or may not be work-related, but they help us work better together. How's the diet going? Who told you I was on a diet? Oh, nobody, it's all right. But how's it going anyway? How's the kids? Did you get out on your bike today? All those things help us work better as a team. But they, they typically occur when we congregate at these spaces, where you get those who are going outside the building for a cigarette break. We use tools. Um, <clears throat> a lot of this stuff is intuitive. I was having a chat earlier just before we started. And the question was asked, uh, so um, did I do anything in terms of training with psychology or, or behavioral modeling? Not really. It's intuitive. A, a good deal of it is common sense, to be perfectly honest. But we do use tools. So I'll be able to look at somebody, having dealt with groups for many, many years, and, and, and understand how people behave for, for a, a good many years. Um, we started to use metrics or, or tools, and I didn't find that they helped that person explain that person to me, but it helped explain that person to them. Because to, you, to get these reports, um, and uh, I, there's 
I'm going to say my new interns. I've got my new interns over there. Um, there, are, there are free online tools that can give you this kind of metrics. You might have done them yourself. Uh, there's there's um, 16 personalities. There's mm -hmm. Belbin. There's all this kind of stuff. There's loads of freebie stuff out there. The, the freebie stuff is good, but it's not that accurate. Um, the, the paid for stuff, you know, you get what you pay for. It's the usual story. So we use metrics, but I don't use these metrics to, and the reports that come from them, there's a big, I don't know, 30, 40 page report behind that thing, to tell me anything I don't know. But it's ever so useful for me to show that to the person who, who, who's done those online questions to see it for themselves. Because quite often, they don't, they don't, they get a completely different view. Is that how people see me? Is that how I am? Is that how I react? Well, yeah. You filled in the answers, so yeah. Disc. Has anybody heard of disc? Show me your hands if you heard of disc. No. Brilliant. It means I know more than you about this then. It means nobody's going to ask me any hard questions about disc. Put your hand up if you heard about Belbin. Yeah, okay. Belbin. And any other models? Give a shout out any other things that you've done? Those are the two main ones, maybe? Myers Briggs. Myers Briggs. Yeah, Myers Briggs. Well, Myers Briggs, Belbin is about team roles. Myers-Briggs is about personalities. DISC is about uh, behavior. It's different. One is external, one is internal. But Myers-Briggs and, and uh, uh, DISC, which is Marston, both come from Jung, Jungian theory on behavior. So whereas 16 is basically four times four, uh, lo and behold, which is, these are four parameters here. So you can split them up even further to get 16. That's where the Myers-Briggs comes in with 16 personalities. But I use this because it's easier to understand, it's easier to explain, and it gives me what I need. I'm not so concerned in the e-practice about, um, about a likes and dislikes, the personality behind it behind the person. I'm not so concerned about that. I'm more concerned about strengths and weaknesses and how they view the world and how the world views them. And this gives me that. And it's much easier to explain, as I said. So it's Marston, uh, and this is very simplified, but D-I-S-C, DISC. That's dominant. I is influential. S is supportive. And C is conscientious. And I'm going to there's a, there's a slide that will explain these. And I think I, I was going to say you might begin to see yourself, but I think that's less and less true the more I deal with people and teams and so forth. But if you've come in with a group, and I have done this with a group in this room, where they know each other well enough, and I explained about an individual, and the other two are going, oh, yeah, how would you know that? It's not rocket science. They filled in the questionnaire. So, um, DISC uses a, a, a graph, and this is the metric that I, uh, we get out of the, 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 the report, if you like. <clears throat> so we've got the DISC at the top there, dominant, influential, supportive, conscientious. I'll, I'll explain what they are in a minute. And then we have an intensity scale here. So you're least like this. this you run a country mile from this kind of behavior. This explains you to a T. You can't help yourself. It's a pathological problem with you. Um, so, and that's where it becomes more tendencies there or fewer tendencies there. And without oversimplifying it, we're kind of like a mixture of all of these. So you'll get a line graph that goes through all of them. And there are ways of interpreting those. So it's not binary. It's not I'm all this or I'm not that. It's a bit of a mixture. I mean, you know, you could be bouncing along the middle on all of these. And we can see scales there, which put a metric to the intensity. I didn't think we'd be able to read this, but I think we probably could. It's a really good uh, projector. Um, <clears throat> so on this scale, you've got D, I, S, C. And these are blends in the middle here. You've got um, going from this corner over here, dominant, to influential, steady, compliant. And... Uh, if I were somewhere halfway between these two, I'd be quite an open, friendly person, influential to steady, uh, patient, as it says. If I'm up here in this corner over here, so D and I, assertive, self-motivated. So the dominant is uh, 
a dominant character. We've got some names like that. We've got the you know, latest guy maybe is Donald Trump. You know, dry, driven, Steve Jobs, driven, driven people who are just, they, they're like bulldozers. They go straight through. Influential is uh, a second-hand car salesman. He'll just convince you that that thing is the best car you can buy and you need to buy that car even though you can't afford it. So he's very influential. Friendly, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's going to be quite open to conversation. He's going to be engaging. Steady down here or, or supportive is they make great Samaritans. They, will, they have an ear for everybody. They will listen till the cows come home. They're not interested in you knowing their name. They're interested in you being okay. Uh, and compliant over here, or conscientious, are the high attention, uh, sorry, high uh, uh, focus of attention people. They've got a high attention span. These, these guys are super accurate when it comes to research. They're the ones for whom they don't like being put on the spot. If this is you, you don't like being put on the spot. You don't like being asked for your opinion just like that. You like to have some research first. You like to know what you're going to talk about. You like to cover all the bases. You're one of those people that, um, and thank goodness I've got them in free form, you're one of these people who worry about whether a report is in the same font. These guys are worried that you know, the report's got out the door. Um, these ones are the ones who will kind of put the whole thing together and say that it's, it's accurate and we've got it together. These guys are like, are the footers all the same? So I, I did break it up, uh, but we, we can see it from the first slide. So dominant, positive, is signed is independently minded, motivated to succeed, generally uh, very, well effect, very effective at getting their own way. They're forceful people. Depending on intensity, and I'll show you some graph examples in a minute, Negative is they can be hot-tempered. Do you know somebody like this? Do you know somebody who is just basically bullish about getting their way and kind of, maybe not hot-tempered, but gets the raging hump if, if, if you disagree with them? They see it as a, as a, as a negative thing. They see it, they see it as, as a, having a personal thing. You're having to go at them personally. Dominant can be, can be summarized as a factor of control. So they're quite controlling people. And I said, we, some of the examples, uh, Steve Jobs and Donald Trump, think of th some others. Um, who else uh, who do you think is dominant? Any ideas? Give me a name for somebody who's dominant. Jose Mourinho. Jose Mourinho. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, wasn't he called the, the something one? What was it? The, special. the special one. Self-coined, I think, wasn't it? Yes. Self-coined. So the driver for this is achieving. It isn't about necessarily the accuracy. It isn't about the, uh, how, many, how many people we hurt on the way or whose feelings we hurt. It's whether we get the job done. Did we achieve what we set out to do? They don't naturally trust others. They seek to attain their own success without asking or expecting help. Should a situation arise where the assistance of others is unavoidable, is an unavoidable necessity, They'll tend to issue orders directly. They're take control guys. They're quite scary. Influential. As I said, second-hand car salesman. Uh, positive side is they're really communicative, socially confident. These, you tend to find these guys in communication departments within companies. They're the ones that put together the funky videos and the, and the, and the kind of cool music that like we, we saw at the beginning. I might show it again at the end. Um, I was rather proud of that. I thought it was a very cool video. But these guys, they... Oh, dear. Hang on. Wasn't meant to happen. Uh, these guys are uh, impulsive, emotionally-based approach to life. So they, they do work with people, but they have, they have a limited range. They have a limited uh, 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 patient span. So like a second-hand car salesman, if you're not showing him much interest, he's going to go off the boil pretty quickly. Influence can be summarized as communicative and outgoing with well-developed social skills and an urge to meet people, meet and talk with other people. These are the guys that if you're caught in a lift with them, they will start the conversation. They want to know your name and how you're doing. Dominant will just leave you be. Dominant just doesn't care. 
Dominant is just interested in getting out that lift. Steadiness or supportive. As I said, these are your more Samaritans. They, they um, measured, steady, patient, undemanding. They can be resistant to, resistant to change. Predictable. They, they like a predictable and, and a constant environment. So if, if D's and I's will change the rules on a dime, to use an American phrase, supportive or steady really struggle with that. Supportive like the rules and stick to the rules. These were the rules. We made these rules. They were good rules. Why did you change them? So they're kind and patient, sympath sympathetic listeners. You need guys like this in an office. Real interest in others, fulfill support roles, uh, persistent approach, powers of concentration. They have a passive approach, so they're not gung-ho. They will slow the pace down if they feel as though the whole team is not going together. High Ds will drive it because the program says we should finish on time. High Ss are saying, well, hang on, these guys are struggling over here. And then the final one, conscientious. Conscientious or compliant, precision, accuracy, desire for fact and detail. They dislike pressure and they tend to adopt an evasive style when confronted. These people are great with, and I'm going to be so generalizing, and, but they're great with spreadsheets. They're the ones that will go through and find the errors. They're the ones that, as I say, I've got a couple in the company who, you know, they, they badger me about font. I mean, that was a real thing, by the way, the font. I had a message come through, did you know the font wasn't the same? And I sent back, I don't care. I'm just glad the report's done. But they are particular about that. And we need those people because they keep the high Ds out of jail. They are rule-oriented. If Ds and Is will make the rules, the supportive and the conscientious like an environment, they feel safe uh, having rules. They'll want to know what the rules are. Um, you'd, what's really interesting is you'd think that a very high D and a very high C is like oil and water. Because one is gung-ho, change the rules, make it up as you go along, driven, driven, driven. And the other one is detailed, slow pace. I like research. My wife's a high C. And it makes for a very interesting marriage. She's, she's all details. She hates being put, on, being put on the spot. She likes to do her research first. I'll change the rules. And she'll come back and say, but those weren't the rules. These were the rules. But she keeps me out of jail, which is great. So people like this like structure and detail and a desire for control, uh, uh, control over their environment. Conscientious individuals are passive, reticent to speak out. They're the quiet ones in the room. They usually have personal codes of behavior, tend to regard tradition as important, and have a relatively broad general or specific knowledge skills. One of the guys in Freeform has... Uh, an incredible, I mean, he's, he's, he's a bright guy. He's a very high C. And he's like, he's like, he's like garlic. You, want, you only want a little bit. You don't want too much because it'll, it'll blow everything out of the water. Um, but all you need of this guy is a little bit because it's enough in terms of he's bright enough to get to the right solution very quickly. High, high attention to detail and specific knowledge and skills. So the these and I's will... Get in there, and if the rules aren't working for them, they'll change the rules. High C's and high S's. If you're in a, in a team, and there's always that one who seems to be half empty, it doesn't matter how, what the team is doing or what the company talk or something like that, and there's always somebody who's half empty or mutter, 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 mutter in the background. We didn't do it this way. We didn't always do it this way. Chances are they're a high S or a high C or just grumpy. But if they're a high D or a high I, they will, they'll go with it because they can see where it's going. So basically, I work to my strengths and manage my weakness. So in the e-practice, the team are spread all over the world and they are meeting virtually. I, I I've intentionally haven't gone into the mechanics of how we work um, because I'm sure you'll have questions about that and that will take a whole nother talk to be perfectly honest. Um, 
I thought it might be more interesting to, to look at the psychology because some of this stuff you could take back to your practices now or where you're working or your life or your studies or whatever. Because this is about knowing oneself without sounding all touchy-feely and TED Talk type. Um, I did say it was going to be like a TED Talk. But it's knowing ourselves. So the first thing when I started out, started out in 2009 was knowing myself. So if it's going to grow, what do I need? Well, uh, I need other people to manage me. Because if you look at this there, remember I said this is a pathological problem over here. And that's my D. That's like Mugabe land. That's, that's right up there. And if I is influential and S is my sense of care for other people, remember they are the Samaritans, my S is like minus 27. And my C, if C was the guy's interested in the font and the detail and so forth, my C's in the negatives over here. So in other words, personality like me, I'd be great up front. I could do something like this and wing it, and it'll be fine. You wouldn't know any different. It'll look confident. The details might be a bit sketchy, but if it's come over with confidence, you might not know that. So I need other people to manage me, and this is how we built up Freeform. Um, not necessarily psychometrically testing everyone because I, it becomes intuitive. You, you kind of know after a while. But we did this as a Christmas party, uh, believe it or not. We, what we did, it, it wasn't as boring as it sounds. We, we had a lot of fun where we took the whole team out and uh, four times a year we take the team out. So we, we get everybody, every three months, we bring them together. What, what, except, and I know Luis is listening, except Luis, because I'm not flying him from Colombia. Um, and we bring them in from like Europe or wherever and we go out together. And those were the, the pictures, which sounds really cool. Um, but then we don't meet each other during the rest of the year. All of them are handpicked, and it, that's intuitive understanding of, of how they behave and their strengths and their weaknesses. So coming back to me, I need managing. Where do I need managing? I need managing in the area of delivery. I'm not a high C. I'm going to be dealing with other people within the company. So outside the company, the high I, or reasonably good I, that I should be a little bit more up there, but um, is fine. You know, I'll be good outside. But here, where we're talking about relationships inside the company, or even longer term relationships that need that patience level, I'm going to need help. I'm going to need help because my, this is my natural disposition. So uh, Sonia, who's here this evening, uh, works with me. And if we look at her profile, her D is not as high as mine, but that's handy. That means we don't clash. Uh, her I is up there, which means that we've got somebody. Her role is my PA. And that means, I mean, I'll pick up the phone and she'll explain to you better. I'll pick up the phone and say, can you get in touch with this person, organize this, make that event happen, book flights, do any of that kind of stuff. And so her ability to pick up the phone with confidence is her high I. The S is, that's fine because I'm not asking her to mother anybody in the team. So that's, that's handy. And the C is again reasonably low. That's great because I'm not asking her to do things ad infinitum that needs a, a strong level of concentration. She works best on project. There's a goal, there's a goal, there's a goal. Let me just hit those, we go down. So that mix works well for that role. So that's um, Sonia. And then we've got the dinner table test. To say, well, what makes an effective team? We talked about the psychology, and that's all great. And you might have names popping into your head. Oh, yeah, I know so and so. They're a, bit, a little bit like that. We change the vocabulary. Uh, apart, the, the vocabulary used to be that person is just a grumpy git. Now it's not within freeform. I'm just talking about other companies. I'm not saying within freeform. Um, now it's that person's a high I or a high C, or there might be a high D. We change the vocabulary a little bit. Uh, which is good because it means that we understand each other. We understand their strengths and their weaknesses. They understand their strengths and weaknesses. Sometimes you say, oh, yeah, you know, I, I know I'm being a bit picky, but I'm a high C. Well, yeah, that's, that's changing the vocabulary. So we also have something called the dinner table test. So what does that mean? It means that what makes freeform work, what makes any effective team work, you see, you can take that stuff away and apply it in your regular teams uh, within the... Um, uh, companies that you're in or, or wherever you are, whether you're still at uni or, or whatever. The point is that it's still applicable. And the I call it the dinner table test 
because there are lots of people uh, we've interviewed um, as another guy who's senior. I've got a senior team and a junior team, and then the support teams, which are like admin and comms and everything else. So my senior team and I will we'll meet together and we'll talk about strategy. We'll talk about where we're going as a company. What do we want to do? Do we want to get too big? No, we're having fun. Cool, we'll stay with that. Um, and we do some funky stuff together. And um, we, so I get together with the senior team and they're mentoring the junior team. So I'm mentoring the senior team to be where they want to be, which is maybe own their own businesses. And they're mentoring the junior team, which is they want to be better engineers or architects or whatever. But all of them have one thing in common. They have teachability. We don't have any big egos in there. And that's the dinner table test. The final test, because I've interviewed people, is um, how do you fit around the dinner table? Because that's when we get together. That's when we do our thing. We're all you know, probably good to great designers in here. But uh, as we grow along that, that, that pathway of our career, but what's the ego like? How teachable are we? And that's a biggie with me. So all of the guys are handpicked. I have interviewed folk uh, who I just, when they nipped, and I'll do an interview in a pub, by the way, and I'll go off to the loo and I think, dear God, I can run now. Because um, the ego is, is, is taking up both chairs. Um, but all these guys are handpicked. They're either known by me or they were introduced by somebody who's known by me. And I can suss them out really quickly. Uh, not only they're good, you know, they, they're going to be good because to be recommended, you go to some of these firms, you know, you, you've got to be good to get in there anyway and, and, and uh, have the CV and, the, and the, the, the qualifications and what have you. But the dinner table test, that's what makes, that's a glue. The glue is the relationship. Everybody wants to be around that table. That's why I've only got pictures about tables um, because they all want to be around that table. The spouses know each other, the wives, the girlfriends, the boyfriends, or whatever. They all know each other. I say know each other. I mean in terms of, hi, how are you doing, how's things, how's the kids, that sort of thing. It's a great relationship. So using all this, I'm watching time. How do we construct a team? What kind of person thrives in an e-practice? What do they want out of life? And with that, I come to the next one, my next participant, which is Luis, who is probably unmuting as we speak. Um, again, we know my profile. We know that for me to sit down in the early days of Freeform and do the calc pack and do the minutiae checks, the bearing checks and the buckling checks and all that kind of stuff, you know, oh God, <laughs> losing the will to live. Um, and that's because my C is so low. And who would have it? Luis, who's on the call, is a high C. So I'm in the negatives down here, he's in the positive. And Luis will share a little bit, uh, as I hand over to him now, how, about his story with, with Freeform, how he works. He's Skyping in from Bogota in Colombia. And um, with, with this, we can see that this kind of profile is ideal for uh, design. It's ideal for a details person. It's ideal for somebody who wants to kind of say, yeah, okay, I see what you're getting at, but have we thought about this, that, and the other? I'll go in, check that. But his D is sufficiently high to say that he's not a guy that sits still. <clears throat> you could tell from this very early on, and I know one, one of the questions may well be, does it change over time? We can, we can look at that. But that is, it says to me that and when I first met Luis, I could tell instantly all those years ago that he has an ambition. He may not have verbalized it yet, but he has an ambition, and that was to start in his own practice. It's the same thing again with, with Luis in, in Colombia. And, and Sonia's story, which is relationships and how we work, managing us, uh, our weaknesses, playing to our strengths. So to, to wrap up, to summarize, um, I'm gonna ask Luis to stay on the line in case there are any questions, but um, are we undoing the, un, the revolution? The, I'm just talking about the industrial revolution, meaning are we putting people out of the factories and back into the, uh, back then it was the fields, but they decided what field they worked in, for how long they worked, where they worked, and so forth. And it's similar. We're deciding how many hours we worked, where we work. Um, we've perfected the office in the backpack. There's a George Clooney movie about that somewhere. But the, we've perfected the office in the backpack so I can run, any of the team can operate what they do from anywhere in the world with an internet connection. Um, sort of. It's not for everyone. It's not going to... 
it isn't for everyone. It's no good pretending that it is. It's a model. We believe it's the first. I see and I struck deep think it's the first. Um, but it won't be for everyone. Some people enjoy the stability of the office. And the other thing to remember is, look, no matter how much I would love it, HS2 is not going to come to a, to a, a virtual e-practice. It's not going to happen. Um, it works. We have a 95% team retention uh, ratio. And the 5%, we had to boot him out. I'm not going to mention his name in case he sees this video. But he was a part one architect. And he was supposed to spend one year. He ended spending two. And he, we had to kick him out to go and finish his part two. Um, so it wasn't we were getting rid of him. He just, I think he liked earning money. But he had to go back and finish anyway. And the main drivers, I believe, for the future will be data speed and coverage. I don't believe it'll be internet or Wi-Fi because as GSM, uh, HSPDA and so forth becomes faster and faster, we're now going to 5G. I think 4G was roughly about 20 megs. 5G is going to be even faster. And now we're into the internet of things and IPv6, if any of you are into that, and hexadecimals. So um, data speed and coverage. You're going to find the net mobile networks. Mobile networks are now giving you home broadband, aren't they? So that's, uh, and it's based on, on, on SIMs as well. And battery technology. Interestingly, those are the two that I've picked on because I think everything follows those. It's all well and good having a widgery doodah gizmo that does all the stuff, but if a battery dies in an hour, it's useless. It's a paperweight. I believe it's going to be driven by bat battery technology and data speeds. And the industry will then funnel kit to make it work for that. Um, if you want to know more, we, we do a lot of this stuff uh, called Freeform Discovery. There's three Freeforms in the group. There's Freeform Consulting that does civil engineering. It used to do everything. Uh, but which architect wants to go through a load of bridges to find some cool photographs about a house? Not really. So then we set up Freeform International. And all the cool stuff, sculptures and whatever, all the jazzy bits, are on Freeform International. And we set up Freeform Discovery when we started doing... Uh, leadership training uh, and team building, team effectiveness with uh, organizations, external organizations. We've gone into the Youth Offending Service. We've gone into other companies and just that are possibly struggling and they don't know why. And we've looked at their team effectiveness and, you know, moved a few cards around, got rid of some cards and, wow, it works. Um, so we, we do that through Freeform Discovery. And that's it. I can relax now. I'm going to throw a hand back to Simon and if you've got any questions.